Hey everybody and welcome back. Today we're talking about OAuth 2.0 with Authentic. But before we get there, let's have a quick whistle stop tour. So if you've been following my videos, I've already shown you how to use Authelia. And that's a pretty good product. It bakes into the traffic proxy and it provides sort of a middleware between your service and an authentication layer. And whilst it supports OAuth 1.0, it's important to state that 1.0 and 2.0 are discrete things. Although they share the same name, the version difference isn't just a bump, it is a fundamentally different product. Which leads nicely on to, well, what is OAuth 2.0 and why would you want it, especially in a home lab? Well, OAuth 2.0 is a delegated authorization service for your applications. So what that means is any application can delegate the authorization. Usually you would have to put in a username and password on the app's login page, but instead you can drive this through Authentic. So once you've got OAuth set up for your applications, you should only need to log into Authentic once, and then you can log into all of your respective apps, thus creating single sign-on. And this is very similar to anyone who works in an enterprise setup where typically you would log into your laptop or desktop and you'd have access to all of the services that you need to do your role. So in a home lab environment where you're constantly spinning up lots of containers and running different things, it's a great idea to have something like OAuth because you can log in once and have single sign-in across all of those applications. Now there's pros and cons to single sign-on. Some people call it a single point of failure but I like to have a glass half full approach. So if you can make your one account really strong with a complex password and multi-factor authentication, it's better than having lots of weak passwords or having to remember lots of other ones. I know I've already showed you how to do Vault Warden and there's nothing wrong with having Vault Warden having unique passwords for everything. But if you want something that's more enterprise ready, you want to play with OAuth 2.0, let's get into it. So in this video, I'm gonna focus specifically on OAuth 2.0. But just bearing in mind that Authentic is a really deep product. There are lots of different things that Authentic can do. And it could be a direct replacement for Authelia if you wanted to. So for example, it can do the proxy setup that Authelia does, i.e. it's that middleware between the application and the login. One other important distinction is you can clearly see that Authentic is targeted at enterprise because it has a lot more plugins for some of the biggest identity providers like Active Directory, Microsoft, Google, etc. So whilst we're going to focus on OAuth 2.0 in this video, please do go and read the documentation, understand some of the features. There's so much under the hood with Authentic. There's just too much to get into one video. So by the end of this video, we're going to be in a position that you can see on screen. We're going to be able to log into Portainer using OAuth instead of the internal one, which you're normally used to, i.e. the admin and your password. Instead, we're gonna be using Authentic to log in as our Authentic user. And to do all of this, we're gonna be using our good old friend Docker. So let's have a look through the compose file and the environment file and just find out exactly what we're doing here. So the Authentic Docker compose stack is comprised of four containers. We've got the PostgreSQL, so the database where it's going to store all of the information for the application. These will be things like your providers, and we'll get onto that later. It's got Redis, which we've seen before, which is a value, a key value pair stored in memory. So that will give you an idea of kind of who this is aimed at. So I mentioned before enterprise, something like Redis would be useful for an enterprise setup where you've got, say, hundreds if not thousands of people trying to log in at any given time. Next up, we've got the server, which looks like it's going to connect to the database. And finally, we've got the worker, which also needs to connect to the database, and also, in this case, the Docker sock. One thing that's a bit different in this Compose setup, and it's actually recommended from their setup, and I've deliberately kept it in because we haven't done Docker volumes yet, is a Docker volume that you can see at the bottom. Now, I've typically used bind mounts in my past videos and I prefer those, but I wanted to take this opportunity to have a look at volume so you can see how easy they are to use, but do bear in mind that it makes things like manipulating files and backing them up a bit more difficult. And if you wanted to, you could just create bind mounts instead of these volume mounts. But digging a little deeper now into each of the containers, we can see that for the Postgres, 
it's going to take some values and if you saw my previous video we know that these values are going to be taken from an external environment file so hopping into the .env file it's pretty straightforward so I've created a password and a secret key please go and change these and I've also specified that the ports are going to be different from those defaults. So instead of the 9000 and the 9443, I've specified 1443 and 7000 as these weren't taken. The other bit that's really recommended to do here is email, specifically SMTP setup, so that you can get alerts about logins and password resets, etc., direct to your inbox, which is obviously great for recovery. So go ahead and configure these so that you've got SMTP enabled. If you're using something like Gmail, the instructions are readily available on their website. So heading over to my Docker VM, you can see that I've copied the two files from my GitHub. I've tweaked those for my setup. And now I'm in my command line and I'm in this folder here. So if you look at the compose file, you'll see that those volumes are actually specified with a dot slash. And in my last video, we know that a dot slash is gonna put this file in the current directory. So all of those Docker volumes that it creates are gonna be stored within our compose folder here. Typically I do that in its own slash Docker, but you'll see what happens in a moment. So to run this container, we simply do a sudo docker compose up dash D. That's gonna go away and pull those images and hopefully you won't get any errors and you'll be up and running. So when it's completed, you should get the following messages that it's all started and there's nothing wrong. So before I go and check those logs in Portainer just to make sure everything's okay, let's have a quick look in the folder here where we ran the Docker Compose file and hopefully we should see those volumes that were specified in the Compose file. So if I do a refresh, there they are. We've got the search volume, we've got the custom templates and we've got the media. So logging into Portainer, we can see that the four containers are up and running. And if we have a quick look through, the database is ready to accept connections. That looks good. Redis is up and running. It's got a warning that we could go and fix, but for our setup, we're not gonna to need to do that. It's about a memory overcommit, which would obviously be an issue in a larger environment. The server is up and running and is available on the port that's specified, so that's good. And finally, the worker. All of that looks good and it's made connections to other containers and there's no error messages here. Brilliant. So now we should be ready to go and reach this through the web GUI. Now in my setup, I've specified the Docker IP address and the port 7000, which is what I put in the M file. So for those of you who are thinking, why are you not accessing this through authentic.jimsgarage.co.uk like I have in all of my other videos through that SSL reverse proxy, I recommend that you do go and do that. But for this video, I wanted to keep it really simple and just get you up and running. Then later, you can go and add this behind a reverse proxy. And I do recommend that you actually use a proper domain for this once you get the systems up and running. But for now, we're just gonna leave it simple with IPs and ports, and we can always change that in the future. So the first time you load up Authentic, unfortunately, it doesn't take you to the page that it should do. It takes you to the login page. Now, we can't do the login page because we haven't created an account. So just double check and make sure you go to the following website. And once you hit this website, you should be ready to create your first account. So this is gonna be your admin account for your authentic. So make sure you remember it and be prepared to use this to log into other apps, or you can create another account once you're logged in as an admin. So I'm gonna populate this and log into my account and I'll see you on the other side. So with that populated, I'm gonna hit continue that's going to log us into Authentic and we're pretty much ready now to start using Authentic. But as I said, Authentic is a bit of a minefield. So I'll get you set up with Portainer and this should give you all of the tools to be able to go and set this up for other supported applications. So the first thing we're going to need to do is to create a new application and handily that's right in front of us. So let's click create a new application. I'm going to give it the name Portainer. When you type Portainer, it'll automatically generate the slug and that's used in URLs. Don't worry about that. It will just be a slash. The group I'm going to leave blank. The provider I'm going to leave blank just because we haven't created a provider yet. We'll get onto that in a moment. All of the other options I'm going to leave blank and I'm going to hit create. 
So that's created the application, as you can see in the top right. I'm going to cancel that now. You can see the Portainer application created here. And let's go to providers now, and we're going to create a provider for this application. So again, we're going to hit create. And for this one, I'm going to use OAuth2. But to my earlier point, look at all of these different types of authentication and authorization tools that we can use. There's so much here. I'll be coming back to this in future videos just to make sure that you're all up and running with all of the various different things that you might want to make your home lab as flexible as possible. But let's click next on OAuth2. And I'm going to call this one again, Portainer. For the authorization flow, I'm going to choose an explicit consent. So it's going to ask me each time. It's a confidential client type. And then we get on to the important stuff. So we're going to need to remember the client ID and the client secret. Don't worry, when you hit finish, you can get back into this. It's not like a one-time password that you have to record. And that's pretty much it for setting this up. So let's go and click finish now. And we can see that it's here. It's not assigned to any application. So now that we've set up our provider, we can go back to the application. We can click on the edit button and the provider for Portainer app, we can choose the Portainer provider. So now we click update, everything's fine. And if we go back to the providers click here, you can see that it's now assigned to that application. Now, you don't need to create a new provider for every single application. You could have a one to many relationship. So one provider to many applications. But it might be that you have a different type of authentication. It might be something like SAML for, I don't know, Proxmox. But you get the idea, you could choose any type of authentication you wanted. So the next bit we need to do now is to head over into Portainer and tell it that we want to use OAuth instead of the internal login. Let's go to Portainer now. So here I'm logged into my Portainer and it's the Docker instance that's running Authentic itself. And you can see in the top right hand side that I'm logged in as my admin, which is probably the default account that you're using. It's called the internal user. So this is where you go to Portainer or whatever the IP address is, and you log in with the username admin and whatever password you've chosen. What we're gonna do is be able to log in with the email address that you registered for Authentic. Now, there's a couple of steps to that. We need to create an OAuth workflow. We need to create an OAuth link back to Authentic. And we also need to add that user in. You can apparently make it create that user dynamically, but I didn't have any luck with that. So maybe there's a bug, maybe it'll be fixed in the future. But anyway, follow what I'm gonna show you here and it will work. So on the left-hand side, you wanna go down to settings. You wanna click authentication, pretty straightforward. And you'll see on the right hand side, we've got OAuth. So let's click that. And the bit that I mentioned before was automatic user provisioning. Now this should create the user that is in Authentic once it's trusted, but I didn't have any luck with it. So I'm gonna leave it off for now and I'm gonna manually add that user. Don't worry, it won't take long. So let's scroll down here and look at what we need to fill. So scrolling down the page, we see some fields that are pretty familiar to what we saw within Authentic. And that's pretty much what we need to do. We need to copy the values from Authentic into Portainer. So where do we find those? Well, let's go back to Authentic. Let's click on the provider. And then we're gonna click the edit button. And now when we click the edit button, you can see the client ID and the client secret. So I'm gonna copy the client ID and I'm gonna paste it into the client ID field. I'm gonna replicate that step for the client secret. And then it's gonna ask us for all of the URLs. And to find all of the URLs that you need, you simply need to, instead of clicking the edit button on the Portainer provider, we just click the actual Portainer itself. So click here, and then we get all of the URLs that we need. So I'm gonna quickly copy and paste all of these values here into the respective fields here, and I'll see you in a moment. So now that's complete, and just to point out, the authorization URL here just happens to be my Docker IP and the port that Authentic is running in. 
Just remember if you're using this behind a reverse proxy, this will be your DNS entry. So it might be something like authentic.yourdomain.com. And I do recommend that you do that. I just wanna show you how to do it with a standard IP and port, just for simplicity. You'll also notice at the bottom, there's a user identifier and a user scope. Now, the user identifier for us is the email because that's what we set as our identity in Authentic. Remember, it asked us to create that first account with an email address, and we want to use that as our account for Portana. The scopes we want to give it are email, open ID, and the profile, so it can get all of that data from Authentic. So let's save these settings. And there's one last thing we need to do in Portainer, and that is to create the user that matches our authentic username. So let's head over to users, and then we want to create a new user. So for this username, I'm going to say it's jim at jimsgarage.co.uk, the same ID that I used for registering authentic. So I've pasted that email address in here, and I'm going to make this person an administrator. So now that I've added that and click create user, you can see that it's added down here below. And importantly, you can see that this is an OAuth authentication. So that's pretty much it. Let's go and hit log out in the top right hand corner. And now you're going to see that you've got two options to log in. And fingers crossed, I should now be able to click log in with OAuth. You're going to get taken to the authentic page because we said we want explicit sign-in. So it's going to ask, this requires the following permissions, email address, and the profile information. Now, remember, those were in the scope that we specified within Portana. So let's hit continue. And there we are, we're in. The first time I did that, it said there was an invalid OAuth state. I'm not sure what that was, but I just clicked login again with OAuth and it seemed to work. So maybe there's a little bug somewhere. But the important thing is now you can see, look, I'm in as jim at jimsgarage.co.uk and I've got administrative access to my Portana. Awesome. So now we have delegated authorization to Authentic and we can use this to log into our applications. And that means we only need to manage one account on Authentic and those settings are going to apply to all of our apps because they're set up to trust Authentic. That gives us single sign-on using OAuth 2.0. So I hope you like that little appetizer of what Authentic can do. As I said, there is so much to Authentic that I just cannot cover it in one video. But hopefully with what I've shown you today, you can get most of the applications that support OAuth 2.0 signed up to use Authentic to delegate that access control. If you look through their integrations page on their website, you'll see that there's lots of familiar things there. There's things like Uptime Kuma, Proxmox, TrueNAS, and a whole host more. So I'd be keen to see how you get to use this in your home lab. Why don't you drop me a message in the comments below? I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. And don't worry, we'll be coming back to Authentic in later videos. Take care, everybody.